Hello, hello, good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jill Lerner, president of the AIA in uh, New York for uh, 2013, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the Center for Architecture. Uh, the AIA chapter is proud to host Design in the New Heart of New York, presented by Related Companies and Oxford Properties Group, here at the Center for Architecture's Breakthrough Space Gallery. And we hope you will all join us afterwards for a reception over in the Breakthrough Gallery, where you can see all of the projects, and particularly the project being featured tonight that are part of the Hudson Yards development. We'd particularly like to send our uh, welcome to the Williamsburg High School of Art and Design students who are here to join us, and uh, kudos to Related for organizing that as well. So welcome. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome David Childs, FAIA, and Justin Davidson for a conversation on the complexities of designing a mixed-use building in a mixed-use development. This event is part of a fantastic eight-week speaker series with a full lineup of architects, designers, and civic leaders involved in the Hudson Yards project who are engaging with the architectural community and the public on plans for the Hudson Yards for the very first time. If you would like to address our speakers this evening, please find the note card on your seat and have your questions ready. We will be collecting note cards on the right-hand aisle to share with our speakers. There'll be people on the side to collect them. Before we begin, I would like to bring your attention to a few upcoming programs at the center. The next Hudson Yards Speaker Series event will take place Thursday, June 6th. Howard Elkis, FAIA, Ken Himmel, and Mortimer Singer will discuss modern placemaking, moder moderated by Peter Grant. Please, and then in a separate activity, please join us the following weekend on June 8th and 9th for the Le Corbusier New York Conference. This program begins with an exhibition preview of Le Corbusier, an atlas of modern landscapes at the Museum of Modern Art, followed by a breakfast and symposium here at the Center for Architecture. It ends with a Sunday morning tour at the UN headquarters. Also join us for the opening of the Fit Nation exhibit on June 13th. So, without further ado, I would like, him, like to welcome this evening's moderator, Justin Davidson. Justin has been the architecture and classical music critic at New York Magazine since 2007, writing about a broad range of urban, civics, civic, and design issues. Before that, he spent 12 years as a classical music critic at Newsday, where he also wrote about architecture and was a regular commentator on cultural issues. He won a Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 2002 and an American Society of Newspaper Editors Criticism Award. A native of Rome, Davidson graduated from Harvard and later earned a doctoral degree in music composition at Columbia. He has contributed to publications including The New Yorker, W, The New York Times Book Review, Condé Nast Traveler, and Travel and Leisure. He is a regular columnist for the website eMusic and a member of the Faculty of Design Criticism at the School of Visual Arts. He has also taught in the Goldring Arts Journalism Program of Syracuse University and the NEA's annual Arts Journalism Institute. Quite a resume. So I'm glad I got through it before the end of the evening. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. I was told um, that it was my job to introduce David Childs. I don't know uh, where he went to school uh, and a lot of details about him, but uh, I think for this crowd, there are really only two things that are necessary to introduce David Childs, and those are World Trade Center and Time Warner Center. Don't really need to know so much more. Uh, David has obviously been at the um, helm of uh, SOM for uh, most of his career and even now uh, continues to work with them and has been working, uh, of course, with Related on the Time Warner Center and uh, that relationship continues over into, into Hudson Yards. So um, David's going to do a presentation on uh, the Tower E, is that what we're calling it? Uh, at, at Hudson Yards, which is the mixed-use tower, and he will tell you how everything you need to know about that. And then uh, I have some questions for him, and we'll be welcoming questions from you. Um, I encourage you, as Jill said, to write down questions starting as soon as he begins talking, and uh, just hold on to them until after his presentation, then we'll collect them. Or actually, if it's possible to bring some of them up, you know, even even earlier. And basically, I will be editing them on the fly. And I can't promise to get to more than a few of your questions. Uh, given the time constraints, we're going to try to keep this moving along. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll be leafing through them and trying to collate as many as I can, as quickly as I can. So um, David. Great. Thank you, Justin. Uh, does, my, does this speaker work all right? 
right for all of you out there, or do I have to hold a second one as well? No. Okay. Yes, no? No. No. Maybe if I speak louder, does that work? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Justin, for being here. Uh, I know that uh, I, I would like to believe that everybody was uh, truly interested in just hearing me present, but it got much more of an audience when they heard that you were coming too. <laughs> so, uh, with a bunch of architects, uh, uh, I, let me at least start by showing, as you just said, an outline of the E Tower. That's an awful title. Uh, what's that? Uh, I'm too. All right, I'll be double mic'd here. Is that okay? Ah, uh, thumbs up in the back. Great, thank you. Um, as um, as Justin just referred to, a Tower E. I certainly hope that over time it will get a much more interesting title than what it has. Uh, these parcels have all been labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F, so forth. And uh, but eventually it, they uh, it will uh, gain either the tenant's use or perhaps in this case, since the ultimate tenant will be residing, I'm told, by him. Uh, in the very top floor, St uh, Steve Ross of Related, maybe it will be, even be the Ross building. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, in any case, um, let me uh, begin uh, by telling you that most people I know think of SOM, they think of skyscrapers, and they think of structure. And that's inevitable and proper. Uh, but most of our buildings are low rise, and most of them are urban, and many of them, we're very proud to say, because we love these projects, are on over live railroads. And that's sort of the theme of what I'd like to at least talk to you about as I show you these drawings, because it makes for a very complicated basis. These properties have been held in trust, so to speak, uh, by the fact that they're too expensive to build over. So when the property is available, it's usually as the city has matured, the land has increased in, valuable, uh, in its value, and it's available for uh, development. So in doing some 35 or more uh, of these major projects around the world, uh, let me just show you a couple of them. This is in London, one of the earliest ones we did. Uh, you can see it morph here into a low-scale development done many years ago. Our Chicago office did it. Uh, but it's headed by a, one particular building that I'm very uh, pleased with, which is that building there, and it so, totally expresses the problem, which of course is to get the weight of this very large building out and over to the side. It expresses that on the outside of the building, and that the uh, lesser weights of the plaza and the parking garages are easier to take care of by slipping columns in between uh, train tracks or actually on a few of the cases where uh, there are uh, uh, platforms to do so. Another example, though, without any buildings, is this work that we did as the master plan is for Millennium Park. Here is a great treasure of a piece of land, huge piece of property, uh, that is now rededicated uh, to the people of, of Chicago. It is a place for uh, the band shell, uh, Frank uh, Gehry's in the middle, but also many places for art throughout the entire project, and it's just a great open space. Very few people who go there are aware of all that activity that happens right underneath them. Um, it also happens here in New York. This is a, uh, an example of something that I don't think people are aware of. When Fourth Avenue became titled Park Avenue as part of the extension of Terminal City running northward from Grand Central. People thought of, and, but they don't think as they walk up and down it that there are these tracks uh, right underneath them. They certainly don't realize that as it comes towards Grand Central, which is what this uh, Union Carbide building was and still is, it's now the Chase Manhattan J.P. Morgan building, uh, that that track work spreads out uh, uh, to be able to turn the trains around, this being a terminus, not a through track connection, so uh, through station connection, so that you see here this big open, uh, open, and that's because of all the track work underneath here, and explains next time you go by it why its elevators don't come to grade. You go up escalators to the Piano Noble, you thought maybe that was just an architectural device. In fact, it's needed 
to be able to get the people up into the high-speed elevator that rise up from a, from a higher lever up through the building. Uh, but the best and the most extraordinary piece of property is this great horizontal uh, uh, swath, this belt that goes through New York. Uh, we think of uh, Pennsylvania Station. Many people don't realize that to get to it, they had to build under the two rivers. Uh, they had to channel through the, uh, the rock, the granite rock, this great path uh, through the middle. And I thought I would just tell you a little bit about uh, as we approach from the middle of the island, from the connections at Madison Square Garden, which was the Penn Station, uh, and uh, connections to the subway, how you move on to the other great development uh, pieces, uh, Moynihan Station, Ninth Avenue development, and then, of course, the, the really, truly great anchor of this space, inland that actually gets wider as it goes to the river because of the tracks spreading out to be the holding yards for uh, many of, of the uh, uh, trains themselves. So to take a look at this, it's a, we did a number of schemes for Related and uh, Vernado uh, of what could happen at Pennsylvania Station itself. Uh, the idea was to take Madison Square Garden down uh, entirely and relocate it uh, into the back of the annex uh, of the uh, post office building uh, that was to the west of the old post office itself. This is what, uh, and, Madison, and Madison Square Garden agreed to this, but the delays and the work that it caused to do, it just finally fell apart of its own weight. What you've seen more recently in yesterday's newspaper uh, was the Municipal Arts Society's uh, uh, competition or at least uh, an idea about engaging people to do a number of schemes. This is our scheme that actually expands that site uh, to four blocks wide rather than the two and has a series of spaces that celebrate the transit, bring light down as it was originally brought down in the original Pennsylvania Station along with all sorts of retail, commercial, and civic uses uh, throughout. To the west of that, and this always brings a pang to my heart because it was a project that I did uh, now 15 years ago, I received a great deal of favorable comment. It actually went so far as to be approved by the Congress, authorized by the Congress, and then even appropriations had been given. Somehow in the last few weeks of the uh, Clinton administration, that bill never got signed by him, and what would now have been uh, working for almost 10 years was never built. A great intermodal hall uh, where the section between the annex and the old post office is, bringing people in, turning them around, and feeding them down to the main axis of the space uh, at 8th Avenue. But we are working on it. It will be uh, focused on the old uh, post office itself, and it's making progress uh, as we speak. Um, to the immediately to the west of the annex building is a large piece of land owned by Brookfield and they are now uh, developing uh, plans for that to go ahead. So this is all rushing apace with these pieces together despite the long span and then you get to the great anchor as I said at the, uh, at the uh, rail yards as they go towards the Hudson. Uh, this is an extraordinary piece of property because of its width and its length. A great place for building a new city, as Jill said, within uh, a city itself. And marked there in the center is what is known as Tower E. Uh, if you will remember from the old drawing, it is one of the pieces that has no hard land to step on. Uh, some of the eastern uh, towers uh, actually do have uh, uh, places for anchoring underneath them uh, to hard land. But uh, it is, and I'll go back one, one second here because I do want to say something about the site itself. We often begin thinking just of that horizontal stripe and the fact that Related is planning a major and important public uh, park coming from the center axis down through the site and then to the river itself. What uh, struck me immediately, of course, is that it's at the confluence of the Hudson uh, Boulevard as it comes down from 42nd Street. And while all architects, we always look for um, what makes our site unique, this one really is, not just because of what's underground, but because of the, of the great confluence of those two uh, open spaces coming and turning to the west at this particular location. 
So it seemed to me that, in fact, as this massing might be able to express not just uh, full development rights as, as were permitted, but to recognize that turn and perhaps in that massing recognize the sweep and become a pylon or a pivot point about which it could move as it goes to the, uh, to the Hudson River. As the building would step up, because it is such a, a variety of different uses, getting to a much smaller footprint of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, residential at the top, it also would create other places where that movement could be uh, expressed, but always at the southwest, uh, southeast intersection, that pivot point being expressed totally vertically throughout the project and relating to the uh, center space in the middle. The program, uh, I will show you, is, uh, is a very complicated one, one that doesn't really want to be on top of nothing. Uh, it has places that one can needle through for direct loads coming down, but all of those demands that every single use in a building wants to have, service, uh, a lobby, uh, entrances, all have to be done in this very tiny footprint. And here you can see this section here, right underneath the, the bottom line there, of course, is all the trains moving uh, east-west. You have a series of retail, I'll go through the program quickly, but you can see how naturally it steps back uh, as it goes to the crown in the sky. Um, the, the bottom floor uh, is the main floor, and there you see with the coloring there, all these different uses, crowding and bustling each one uh, out for uh, an access to the light and to the air and to the core on the middle. Those four horizontal lines are the lines of the active track work. Uh, they are sort of uh, the, the rhythm of the music. Uh, they're hard to, uh, not to ignore. It's the only place in which the program defers uh, and, and, and tries to struggle with that, with that east-west grid is actually in the core for the residential. Uh, everyone feels, and I, and I know it to be true, that you're happy to come into your hotel, be whisked up as you are in the Mandarin, in Time Warner, for example, and then go up to your, after checking in at a higher level. But here, when you come to your house, you want to go in, get to the elevators, and go directly to your floor. So uh, since the axis of this now is from that pivot point back, uh, the elevators must follow that organization uh, and can't shift uh, on their way up. Uh, the bottom floors are interesting because they're dedicated four floors of retail, in this case uh, uh, specialty sports retail, very active, and above that a major health club. Uh, three floors, and it's not just a few bicycles. This is a swimming pool, uh, places to uh, do all sorts of aerobics and uh, a very uh, important aspect of the entire building, which will serve the entire site. Above that is a typical floor, actually a very good sized floor plate uh, at 33,000 square feet. The corners are turned uh, to afford the view, step back, and also be part of this overall scheme of twisting uh, the mass as it rises to the sky. And then you come to the hotel space where you have amenities, restaurants, back of house, and you check in and then uh, go on up into the building where you have a typical hotel floor and then finally up into the residential towers uh, up at the top as they step down back up to the very top. The question that uh, came about sort of simultaneously with this, of course, was how this might be skinned. And uh, Steve Ross had said to me, he said, you know, there, I said, I'm doing a lot of office glass buildings. Maybe, maybe we ought to think about some stone. And um, that seemed to me to be a reasonable request to think about stone. And, uh, and particularly when I thought about what was being programmed for this site, very logical to have glass in much of this commercial space. Office uh, renters expect it, want it. Uh, and it's dealt, dealt with beautifully here, I think, because there's such a variety of spaces, of types of glass, how they're handled. It's given a great scale to these enormous buildings. But they are, it is mostly glass. So in fact, what I looked at was an idea of how do you have this skin wrap around these more sensuous forms. And I thought about this pleated dress, 
which could expand and contract as it moved around these forms, find a vertical rhythm uh, to, uh, to uh, be expressed in the building, rather than the typical horizontal window, a, 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 a spandrel section horizontal window, and, uh, and allow it to be, take advantage of its slenderness ratio, uh, which is already still a very tall building at 925 feet tall. And here that idea is beginning to be expressed. We're just in the process. This is not a completed design. This is one that was going to wait later in the project. But in fact, because of the, uh, the uh, foundation work is being done, it's been moved ahead. But it's now in the process of uh, evolution that this idea might be that of this fold, one side could be a stone, and then the majority could be glass. So it's not just an even pleat but one that has weighted one side to another, which might give, I thought, a way of actually movement in that facade. As you move around it, your perception of density will change to openness and back. And that building will really respond to you as you move around and see it in different light. It will catch light in different parts of the day in different ways, and uh, could be a, really a, quite a good counterpoint to the other buildings that were being built uh, beside it. And here you see that idea where the, uh, the tower enclosure up there, you can see the glass. It's an eight-foot uh, eight four module. Uh, uh, and then the, uh, the back piece is uh, of stone. And in the plan on the bottom, you can see how that really works. So that uh, in that larger uh, 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 rhythm of the 25-foot module, it's a smaller uh, eight-foot four module, which then gives you this sort of syncopated rhythm as you go through it. With, uh, which works for offices where you have a place for hang your diploma and your view out as well as in the residential and we can tie it all together so it has a constancy all the way through and yet will shift in its, in its character as it changes uh, program. And then a, a, a way of uh, not just bringing that straight down to the ground, but as a dress falls and sort of crumples as it hits the ground, uh, it might get more dense where uh, the, uh, the exercise places and the retail didn't want the light, it could become more denser just by varying that amount of stone. And then again, as a counterpoint to that within that, open up again in the places where you enter into the building and each one of these uh, uh, entrances to the, all the different uses. And so the idea is that to have this varied facade, this diagram of the elevation, and you can imagine, as I say, not just a frontal view, but as you look up to it in perspective or move around, this wrapping around, expressing, and, and uh, uh, giving a, a priority to this curved, uh, curved forms, and then perhaps as it might look uh, against the, uh, the great garden in the middle uh, and uh, set within the other buildings that are there. And so here is a sort of a summary form of that shape as it sits on its site reflecting the angle of the Hudson Yard coming down, the twist and turn out to the, uh, uh, the Hudson River, and doing it in a way that might be able to be developed in a kind of a, a skin that would have some uniqueness to it and uh, relevance to the forms in particular uh, that it surrounds. So that's my relatively short uh, discussion of, of where we are. Um, I look forward to a much more interesting portion now. So David, you've done uh, quite a lot of designing and building in New York, and I'd like to try to, in this conversation, put this building a little bit in its urban context. Uh, it's a unique one in that it's a part of a neighborhood that doesn't exist yet. And so we're trying to imagine filling what is now a very conspicuous void uh, with this incredible density and trying to imagine how this particular building, as you say, a kind of hinge for a whole public space that comes down from uptown, swings around and goes out to the river. And, and how that's all gonna fit in with these very large buildings. Um, and I always feel like the best 
a vantage point for people to try to uh, project that uh, in their imaginations is to stand at the end of oh, the current end of the High Line, uh, looking north and west, and you can see the river and it's wide open, and uh, just try to imagine the scale of what's going to go in there. It's it's really quite um, quite remarkable. Um, so a lot of things come to mind about that context. For one thing, we seem to be at a moment in New York in which uh, the um, new office buildings, uh, the, the, the tallest buildings are either, of course, office buildings or residential towers. They're very distinct types. Uh, office buildings, that market is controlled mostly, uh, the demand is controlled mostly by very high-end uh, businesses for class A office space, which demand very large floor plates, as large as possible, uh, with glass all around so that daylighting can come as far into these big floor plates as possible. And then on the other hand, we have uh, a real estate, a residential real estate market dominated by very high-end residential real estate, where the demands are still for glass and wraparound views, but of course much smaller residential floor plates. So we're getting these big fat towers and these skinny little pencil towers, and, and they're both getting very tall. And it almost seems like there's kind of this duel between them. They're jointly reshaping the skyline. So uh, we'll be able to look at your building going up in the meantime, and it's really, is it, is it fair to say that's a third way? That's uh, obviously it's a mixed-use building, but in the way you've shaped it, is it somewhere in between those things? Does it offer a way to try to combine those in the future for other buildings in New York, or is it so specific in its demands that we're really not going to see this kind of thing again? Uh, I have a, lots of thoughts about all of that, and, uh, and you're uh, very articulate about it. But first, on this issue of uh, building such a dense piece in what is not a dense neighborhood yet, but will become so. Um, it sort of, I guess, I immediately thought of Rockefeller Center, which must have looked like it was out in the moon when it was being built, heaven forbid, west of Fifth Avenue when it happened. But these buildings are not only denser, but they're also taller. So your questions there or thoughts about that, I think are particularly uh, relevant. Um, the building types that have come about have been exactly as you said. What I find is uh, surprising is that often those office buildings don't diminish because the cores diminish. Like a tree, uh, it gets narrower because the, the center supplies get smaller too. Uh, and that's certainly true downtown where the old buildings uh, show the step back uh, happening. And they've been very amenable to conversion to residential because they're so small. But nowadays, these huge floor plates for, for offices, they're really only good for that. And they tend to extrude them straight up and just cut them off. Um, the World Trade Center was that way. And it was, uh, uh, if, if you, I'm sure, remember from being up in there at the top floors, uh, there was just this canyon of this slice of space before you got to the window wall. And there was no acknowledgment of the um, demolition of the, of the core in the middle. And that seems to be generally true of these uh, taller towers, although you'll see some of Bill's buildings here do have a tapering form to them, but they are very different from the residential um, spikes uh, that we see on 57th Street. Um, it's hard to imagine converting one day the Bank of America building to residential. Really? <laughs> well, we'll see. But uh, the, um, uh, it, it is interesting in that there is a, na a, a natural... Uh, demunition that is afforded by this particular grouping of program. Um, it's uh, the amassing of all of those different programs is unlikely because it's so expensive. Uh, you would only do it in Hong Kong or New York, uh, uh, so that. Uh, the, but you, all those uses are in great demand on this site, and I find it actually kind of interesting to have them all stacked together. But plumbing, for example, that comes through residential has to be gathered and put on a different rhythm to go through the offices and so forth. So it imposes a lot of, of changes, and structural changes too, that uh, the shear walls in the residential that are really required to have a, a much stiffer uh, uh, building at the top of it, so you don't affected by the sway has to get to a larger span farther on down. But it's a natural consequence of this program, which was 
given to us by related, and in fact, I think helps it enormously because not only does it make this swing, but it's able to tear us up, and I think is much more interesting um, in its profile that way than if it were just that shape and just went, went straight on up. Whether that can happen elsewhere, who knows? Um, I doubt it. The idea that um, uh, the, the, uh, when, when the uh, English went and did their colonial buildings around the world, they often were wonderful buildings because they would have the ground floors would be the places where they sold whatever was being made in the back room on the second floor. And then the, 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 sh the shopkeepers lived on the third floor. And it created a life and an activity that was quite uh, uh, amazing. And that's, uh, that's kind of fun to see that all packed into one building. But I think it's, uh, it's, it'll be the oddity rather than the usual. So your point about the two basic different types are probably going to be opposed to each other rather than um, laced together. Is it an oddity for structural reasons, for financial reasons, for design reasons? I mean, as you say, you know, we density in a, in a in Manhattan means that all of these uses are in proximity to each other, right. uh, and we talk about mixed use developments when, when we talk about multiple building types in one concentrated area. Uh, what is in P? I mean, these these uh, multi-use uh, buildings are not uncommon in Asia. Uh, what what is preventing us here from doing the same thing? And is it desirable? It can, I guess, to pick up on your uh, idea of the you know the the apartment above the store. Is that really does that really extrapolate when we're talking about s about that scale? Does it really add uh, a kind of vitality that you're talking about? No, I, I, it probably doesn't. And I, I can't answer about the financial. I don't know. But every other aspect of the building, it's, it's, a, it's a major lift to do that for structural reasons or other reasons. Because uh, if you had more room to spread out, you would do, uh, and it would be happy to mix them all, but not block, but building by building rather than by layer by layer. And so. Uh, I think it's, it's unusual. In this case, you think of all this land that's available, but much of it is taken up with um, either a performing arts building or these big tall towers, and not much is left if you believe in giving over a big piece of it to back to the city, which Related certainly has, and their commitment to that public uh, <coughs> space, public art, and the open space is, is there whether it's big enough or, or how it will be at the bottom of the, all that has to be worked out in terms of the design. But if they, I think if they had had four other smaller sites, they probably would have done four other types of buildings next to each other rather than just stacking them. We have done many cases where their hotels are at the top of a building, uh, and that seems to work because as the gravity goes up, people want the views at night and so forth. Uh, and that, uh, that has worked, but only where those properties are tremendously in demand and that you can go to the expense of, of doing those things. And of course, the other president in New York is the Time Warner Center, but there you have different masses the uh, one horizontal and then two separate vertical masses yeah, exactly. to separate out the program. And, the, and as I said, that the one of the I remember from Time Warner, which of course is a double block and much much bigger, uh, it was this tremendous crowding and jostling for every square inch of that ground floor, which is so precious. And this building, on a very small footprint, has got as many uses, and they all want to have their presence there, that's what makes it so difficult uh, in, that, in that plan. Tell me about your experience uh, with this program. I can imagine when you first saw how much you needed to pack into that footprint, given that it's resting on toothpicks with trains going by all the time, that that must have been pretty daunting. One of the most amazing slides, I think, that you showed was the plan of the lobby which looks like some kind of crazy jigsaw puzzle where you've got all of these uses. I mean, you know, the, uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, clear in everybody's memory, but obviously the, the residents have their own entrance at the southwest corner, yeah. right? And they come in and they don't experience the rest of the building, they just come into their lobby and those elevators go all the way up to the top. If you're coming in for the office space, that's a different experience. And if you're going to the hotel, that's a completely different. So all of those uses 
are kind of gnarled together in this in this knot, and of course, all of the mechanical and back of the house stuff also has to happen uh, on that level because there's no basement. Right. Um, so yeah, we just was it um, was it something really new for you? Fun, exciting, completely infuriating to try to work this all out. Well, you know, you always find the things that uh, that make it unique, as I said, and, and that it certainly this has got it in spades. I wasn't sure, I wasn't aware of how many of these issues uh, were all packed together, and uh, uh, one of them I learned was that uh, in most of the cases of working on these uh, uh, above track sites around the world, is that you do find a place where the uh, tracks are either spaced farther apart or there is a platform where you can really come down and put, put something uh, in place. And underneath our, this particular site, there are only those needle conditions. So to get that weight down, you not only have to have the weight down, but as many of you know, the overturning movement of the building is what the critical dimension is. And you have to transfer these laterally to the, to the rock and, uh, that surrounds the site. So that perching itself on the little bitty toes down there down at the bottom is, is, is very, very difficult. And the only space you really have to work in is the space uh, that spans across the relatively tight grid, therefore it's not very deep, of the, uh, of the track work. And into that, the priority, of course, uh, is to either have the things that the railroad needs itself, ventilation, safety exits, and so forth, which need to be accommodated in the above ground buildings, um, but also uh, to the, uh, the, the base of the building, which is the uh, elevators pits that have to happen at the bottom. No place else that they can happen. So a building that comes down, you don't think of it spreading out with all of those needs that it has to have. And elevatoring is one that's particularly important here because by being so tall, I hadn't run into this before, otherwise you make transfers, you can deal with it, is that by that elevator shaft coming all the way down at a high speeds that are required for the residential, you have very deep elevator pits. So uh, what we've been able to do because open land is to work with Tom Waltz, uh, who's doing the landscape, and finding a way to move that landscape up so that we will really be able to have a way to have some added depth at these critical points to take care of that stuff that's underneath there. But it really, it, it is tough, and I suppose that it would have been daunting if I knew at all at the beginning what you do is you keep opening the problems as you get into it and it's, uh, what, what you do want to do at the end of the day is not to have everybody look at this building and say boy did he have a tough time doing that. <laughs> you want it to look like it was just simple and that's um, uh, and I think that's we're going to be able to have, handle that. It's going to work out all right but it sure is a challenge. We have a lot of questions uh, that along similar lines that um, want a little bit more detail about the structural engineering uh, of the building and specifically um, how the building will respond given the constraints of where the building uh, sets down um, and having to build over train tracks. Uh, how it deals with, uh, with the wind oscillations you were talking about what are the implications uh, for the design after Sandy? Uh, we're talking about very low place train tracks underneath um, that are vulnerable to flooding there, even though the base of the Hudson Yard is obviously on a platform that is elevated. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you're dealing with, wh what the specific challenges are structurally, yeah. and how you're dealing with some of those safety and engineering concerns. Well, I wish I had my partner Chuck here, I don't see here, but he's the expert, and so everything I say uh, that's good will be his, and if I make a mistake, it's mine. Uh, but having dealt with this for a long period of time, I think I understand sort of the, the basic issues, which is that, uh, as I said before, when you get to be a very tall building, you can suddenly sort of stop solving for gravity because when you solve for the overturning moment, like the, a mast on a ship, you've dealt with the gravity part already. But this is already, uh, in some buildings, like the, uh, the tallest building in the world uh, that we've done in the, in the Middle East, uh, it can spread out like a tree trunk does and, and, and 
distribute that weight outwards. This comes down and really can't have any spreading characteristics. So uh, not only are you in a smaller place, but you're standing tall and your feet are very close together. You can't even move them out under, under, underground. So that is sort of the basic problem, plus the fact uh, that I, I made some reference to, but which is that um, the guidelines for structure, every structure moves. You want it to move. You can't stop it. Even if you could, it's going to move. And what you do is you solve for what is empirical decisions about in an office building. How much can you stand that building moving in a heavy wind? Well, it seems like it's a pretty reasonable amount. How much can you stand in your bedroom? Almost nothing. So that's got to get a, a sort of opposite ways of thinking of it. It's got to get stiffer at the top, middle, uh, and though, and it's a different kind of. Uh, resolution of that structure up there and a much different spacing and, and the shear walls that take it. But um, one of the things that happened midway in the early parts of this design, and in the exhibit you can see the hundreds of models that we did of all the different options that we thought about, is that that axis was at one time 90 degrees to where it is now. And we moved that initially because the people in the related thought that would be a much better viewing spot if that were diagonal, uh, uh, not a, but a perpendicular the way we have as many views for all the residential uses looking up and out of, of the project. So, but by turning that, the consequence not was only better for uh, the leasing of these, uh, these uh, spaces for the uh, residential, but actually it was better for the structure because you must look at all your neighbors. Now, some of those neighbors aren't there yet, uh, but you look at what is there and what is uh, projected. And the, and the winds from the Hudson River, of course, that corridor that comes down, are quite severe. And by turning that, we were able to substantially lower the demands uh, of it. So you do find times when uh, the, 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 the client demanding and wanting something for a very practical reason turns out to actually have a, a very beneficial effect on the archi architecture as well. And in, in all of the uh, previous work you've done over tracks, aside from the uh, issues of not having the space to sink foundations and so on, uh, are there also problems with vibrations? Uh, yes, the passing absolutely train. right. And uh, those of you who live in some of the older apartment buildings, and you can tell that every time the train goes by, that's the problem. And you must isolate your building from those activities. Time Warner was a perfect example of that, of uh, uh, the ACE and the Broadway lines all coming together there. And we had to create a space of public use for the recording of Jazz at Lincoln Center, which would have no vibrations and no sound. And so you had to build something uh, that would have been easier to do by grabbing on and holding its structure to the side, but it had to be isolated. So it has to really float on there in pins, very complicated situation. Uh, but that must be done in all of these cases, and uh, uh, it, that's something that, that you do in all these buildings nowadays to be able to isolate it from that, from that movement. Uh, you mentioned uh, looking at your neighbors, and of course, you, especially in, with this particular building, since it's part of a large-scale development, and that's what this whole lecture series is about, uh, you're dealing both with the, the, the buildings you know but aren't there yet and the buildings that aren't there yet that you don't know, except maybe where they're going to be placed and roughly how big. Um, as you sit down and design a building like this, what are your thoughts about uh, creating a building in a varied architectural environment where you're not controlling all of the, uh, uh, there's no unified aesthetic, at least uh, not one architect able or one firm able to sort of dictate across different sites. Uh, but you know your colleagues, and to, to what extent did you work together? To what extent are you responding to what they did? And to what extent are you trying to preempt uh, 
something undoing part of your design in the in the future or or contradicting it is there any do you have any control Either. even implied control over what's happening in the future on the well, I should just explain for those of you who don't know there are really two parts to the Hudson Yards there's the Eastern Yards which is the uh, area that is under development now and the Western Yards which will be largely residential uh, which has not been designed yet um, and is in a future phase. So this is right on the hinge of those. This uh, one side faces the Eastern Yards and on the other uh, faces what in the immediate future will be great views of the Hudson River from all floors and in the eventual future will be much diminished views. Or maybe better, because the building would be so great. You know, who does it? Now, your, your point is, is a very good one. It has a, sort of the fundamental root of uh, the issue of urbanism. I kind of like New York, because while it has a very clear order in its grid, that grid allows for enormous variety. And the sense of uh, one architect doing too much is always a problem. Uh, the, the, the texture of New York is really building by building within the block, uh, and things change. And that's what makes it so interesting and wonderful. Here's an opportunity, to like Rockefeller Center, to create um, a hub uh, at the center of all that, but you can't predict what will happen, and certainly over the very longest term, what will be changing because of new energy demands on the skins that we are building today uh, that may have to be altered in the future. So what I think is, um, I'm, I'm particularly interested personally, is to find things about the site that makes it unique, and how that building could be unique to its particular site. Time Warner was defined by the streets, the Circle, uh, Angle of Broadway, and 59th Street coming into it. Uh, this isn't quite so, so clear, but uh, it obviously takes its, its form from that. Um, and uh, it's hard to imagine just picking it up and putting it somewhere else on another block. You might find one. You would certainly never, never find it down the Time Warner site to put that. But that, is, to me, is interesting, and you try to respond to that matter. Um, and if you're up beside some great piece of architecture, some they can mean white or uh, IMP building, who knows, that you are respectful to that. Um, they happen to be your colleagues, even though they're, they're uh, 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 McKim is dead, he's still your colleague and you're working with him. It's just over a much longer period of time. And, um, you, and you can't predict what else will come in between you. But you assume that um, other architects will come in and probably at least notice you and do something in response to that uh, and therefore make these larger patterns that don't jump across, across blocks. Um, but it's hard and uh, hard, much harder in a place that you're not sure what's going to happen to the West. We do have a client that is continuing, so it's in his interest not to diminish the value of what he's just finished on the eastern half. Uh, but um, it's, you, you hope that there will be that kind of uh, sympathetic uh, interest and response um, as that architect or team of architects goes through with it. We did work as a group, although it began really with Bill doing the master plan. He is the... Uh, um, uh, the uh, Raymond Hood of of the project. This is Bill Peterson at KPF. Yeah, and um, and and the architect for the uh, important build, the tallest buildings to the east. Uh, and so those had moved ahead more quickly. But as uh, as Diller and uh, uh, Tom Waltz in particular, and uh, Howard Elkus who will be doing the placemaking and so forth, uh, we've had sessions together uh, where, where we talked about the the progress of it and react to it. Uh, and I, I, um, uh, I must say, I think that we can't forget the landscape piece in the center because that's... I the was little... getting to that. Oh, excuse me. Well, no, no, go ahead. Well, I was just... Um, uh, you, you and I uh, talked about that before a bit. And it's, uh, to me, um, it's sort of this figure void issue here. The most important, in some ways, building here is this void in the center. And the role of all the rest of the buildings is to describe that void. And uh, in New York, and especially something this dense, I think that that's even more critical than in many cases. And what it will be like to be at the base of these extraordinarily tall buildings. Uh, we're, we're used to being on a, used to be on a sidewalk 
at the bottom of the Empire State Building, but we don't have a park that's really at the bottom of what is a whole series of buildings around it. What we do have here is a, a relief valve up the uh, avenue and across to, to the west, which I think will make dramatically different the, uh, uh, the uh, sense of what that space is like. Uh, but it's critical to understand that, and I've, I've, I've talked to um, Thomas about this, and I hope that at some point that Related will actually build a model, rough as it might be, but big enough so you can actually put your head up in that center, because while we have all these little machines and computers, it's not the same thing as actually looking at it. We're really getting a sense of what that would be. It's hard to find precedence, as you asked, uh, because it's, um, you have Gramercy Park or something about the same size, but the buildings are lower. So uh, this is really going to be a unique, a unique effort. But at least the intentions are all right, particularly with the, uh, uh, the client, who is, it's, it's wonderful how concerned he is about that and the public art as well as public space uh, in the, sort of the center of it all happening. So um, first, before, before I ask you one other thing about that, I wanted to ask you whether, uh, just to tell me a little bit about how specifically you may have responded in your design to what you were seeing your colleagues doing? Was there anything in the building where you went down one path and then saw what they were doing and thought, ah, I've got to do something a little different here? Well, uh, yes, in, in several uh, cases. Um, one was to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the skin material. I've described that a little bit about making something that is of glass but also brings in stone in a different kind of way that might add to the vocabulary of the whole. Um, the other is to respond to Thomas's uh, landscape design about how one can enter in the building. And that's not yet fully resolved. So there's opportunity there because I think that's critical. We have the odd condition compared to the other buildings around that center is that the street comes through. So uh, the entrance will be, drive, you will drive down it uh, the, uh, from the avenue and turn uh, west on uh, 33rd. So there's that traffic albeit largely for drop-off for the hotel, that will split you from the uh, rest of the garden that the other buildings won't have. But I think that's an opportunity to try to figure out how we could uh, uh, deal with that, that best. And I know that having worked with... Which is sort of analogous to Time Warner Center where you yeah. have the circle going around and then the plaza across right. the traffic on the other side. Right. Um, uh, so those are some of the things I've, I've, I've thought about, but... Uh, I think there, that's an, for us, because we're still in the process of design, it's a, it's a good place to be because we're able to keep responding to things that are a little bit a step ahead. Are there other questions on cards if you want to, I don't know if there are more coming, but uh, please send them up if there are. Um, and what were you able to do to help the last piece of this puzzle, which was Thomas Waltz's public space. Uh, and just to, just to uh, I think there's a separate talk about that, I'm sure, but um, this is a tremendous uh, challenge for a landscape architect to create a really compelling and powerful center of gravity surrounded by these very tall, mostly glass towers. There really is not much precedent, as David said, for that. And when we think of the great public spaces and how the architecture relates to them, uh, that's a very difficult challenge. So were you able to, in some way, maybe the stone was part of that, uh, sort of take a step towards him and say, okay, I understand, let me help you out here? Well, we, we had a number of conversations, and I think that the real uh, direct com uh, communication will be in this drop-off condition, that people will be able to drive in there, as I just said, and how we uh, facilitate that both on the off on the uh, on our building and into the park will be some that's a real opportunity to do it the grading is the other and he has now got a series of of uh, of uh, fountains that step up like villa lante roman you know villa lante uh, and um, and maybe that will work with our need to get a little bit more height for these elevator pits and all that to work while they're also giving him a platform for the um, uh, uh, planting of trees, all of which need to have space under underground too. And uh, what's critical here is to make sure that it's maintainable. Before he came on board, there was a preliminary design by another in which it was, it was uh, grass, a wonderful place to go lie down on the grass. Well, it's too small for that, 
and it's too dark for that. So what you've got to do, and he's very wonderfully aware of this as a plantsman, not just an overall designer, is that you want to have these things not just survive, but thrive in that condition. So how, that's really largely a, it's a, lands, a hardscape with plants on it, uh, perhaps a ring of trees to be built into it, but much more urban than you would think of as a sheep meadow or even Bryant Park, uh, because it, it just doesn't have that kind of light that you need to have for, for grass. For and he's got the problem with depth also. Uh, exactly right. Building on top of a platform. Exactly right. Yeah. And uh, aeration as well as, uh, uh, you know, if you, if the trees need air and water uh, in their root systems to do well. And the grade up to the entry level of your building, you said, is a function of structural needs and the elevator structural. needs that you so have. It needed to come up anyway because uh, as, as you get to the center part of, the, of their land that moves uh, to the west, there is a rise in elevation. But it's sort of concentrated on our corner, which seems to be difficult, but in fact I think will be a benefit so people will sort of sense an arrival point uh, to be able to both in the park and into this project. Uh, uh, Thomas is also very much aware, which I think is, is right, is that he's setting, just as we might be setting a stage for him, he's setting a stage for mm. art. And Steve Ross is very interested in that. And I think that space will need something. It can't just be a horizontal uh, level of, of landscape, but something that either participatory or some vertical, anyway, he's talking to all the right artists um, and I can't wait for the decision uh, to be made and to see how that will happen and how we may all be, be able to respond to, to that person. So I want to get back a little bit to the question I started out with, which was about the integration of this building, not just into the site, not just into the larger development, but into the city as a whole. Um, I know architects hate it when you say that their building reminds them of other architects' work. But, um, but there were two things that really uh, jumped out at me. And when I was looking at the, the massing, the sort of ellipse, the, the combination of glass and stone, um, and the setbacks, and that's Philip Johnson's lipstick building. Huh. Um, and uh, on the other, uh, the other thing, and it's a completely different kind of model, but as soon as you said the word drapery, and uh, you know, you're looking at a tall building with, uh, uh, a sort of an invocation of fabric. I was thinking of Frank Gehry's 8 Spruce Street. Now, the what, interesting thing about that is that that is a building that he, when he originally th was conceiving the design, wanted it to turn, yes. to, to, to torque. And then because of the constraints on the project and on the financing, that became structurally a pretty conventional T-shaped uh, residential building. So all the movement is pulled out to the facade, and you have these sort of Bernini-esque folds uh, in the metal cladding. Your building actually does turn, because it's got to go around that corner, because you've got this ellipse, and because you've got this uh, shifting uh, axis of symmetry as you go up. Uh, and yet your drapery is sort of the classic, it's almost like an empire gown, right? It just starts at the shoulders and goes straight down, and whatever structural form or body is inside that drapery is not moving. There are a couple anywhere. of hips in there. So. Yes. Um, so those were the things that occurred to me as in some way, not, I don't want to say models, but echoes, uh, a kind of conversation with other buildings. Do you thought, have a reaction to either of those, or are there other things that you Oh, no, I, I was kind of hoping you'd say the Look Building, which is one of my favorite, that curving piece with the uh, Art Deco curve to it. Uh, the uh, uh, Lipstick uh, Building is doing this, is, uh, is a building and that takes a form David for is seemingly doing arbitrary and reasons, you know, and, uh, uh, and then has setbacks in addition to that. Really don't one inch from his mouth, how they and this guy relate is to the program inches. of the building. It's not at the drop-off levels of the elevators or whatever. So there's so, and it treats uh, the two so ends exactly the same, and the back also implies uh, the same situation. It becomes a, 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 a object building, which I think was more driven by um, identity and uh, leasing than anything else. Uh, although there's some detailing in that, it's very handsomely dealt with, uh, there's, a, there's a heaviness to it that I hope will not be present in this vertical nature. 
Uh, and Frank's building, I think, is interesting because it, it does what Frank does, and those pieces are of, uh, of folds of the Bernini uh, uh, Pope's uh, covering is, is exactly right. Uh, but in trying to figure out a way that all of these things could be gathered together, the simplicity of it seemed to me to be right, as it happens there. And uh, um, But I must say, I do take my hat off to that building and how he handled it. He does have the advantage of dealing with one use, uh, which becomes more complicated as you shift, as you go down to the down through the building. Well, for the design, is that an advantage? Or in this case, is did you find that having to deal with all those uses wound up being a positive um, well, I, Contrib I, contribution well, to the design. It, it, sort of, it, it is what it is, and, and there was, uh, the reaction to it is because of that. And so um, uh, it, it's sort of an evolution from that desire, and, and uh, rather than just squaring it off and doing it, you can do a very beautiful horizontal band, banded building, uh, no question in my mind. But to take advantage of the shift as it goes up, trying to organize them all so it does fit within this one sheath dress that has these chances to sh shimmer, but not by itself in the building. It's more about, as you walk around it, I hope that there will be that building. If you run by it, it'll change quickly. If you walk by it, it'll change slowly, but it's responding to you, the observer. So as you come down there, down that avenue, you'll see a density which will open up as you turn the corner and give you a very different feeling as you're going the other direction. And I'd like to explore that as we go through it to see out of that becomes something that is not quite so obvious, but will be uh, distinctly felt and grow with you over time as you relate to it. Um, and so similar to the question I started out with, which is what had to do with whether you think this sort of multi-use kind of uh, massing will be, can be generalized to other things in New York. Is your solution of these vertical uh, stone and glass coursing, um, which, which relieves the kind of texturelessness of glass, do you think that's a way that architects and other architects can and should be looking at facades so that as the city you know, renews itself and glass continues to be popular for all the same reasons it always has been, uh, that, that, that we can find reintroduce masonry into the vocabulary of the city? Well, I think masonry is a, is a great material. It has a porosity that's often difficult to deal with, but there's uh, technological solutions that could happen, and it's, it's a wonderful material. Uh, but I think that the, um, uh, the, the, the real issue of uh, building a building like this is how you bring all of these forms together and, and resolve them. Uh, masonry is one thing, but I find it interesting that as glass has appeared more strongly in all these buildings, that there are many architects that are becoming more and more interested in expressing it differently uh, through the use, use of mullionings, creating shapes or patterns on the building on a much larger scale, uh, different colors of glass, or at least different hints of uh, reflection that don't change the view from the inside. So as you look from it, there are many facades now that are either being developed or has been put on that have a, um, a, a very either painterly or uh, uh, graphic design to them that you wouldn't have seen in, in, in glass a few years ago. Uh, I don't know how it would be to live in the apartment building on 57th Street and have one glass blue and the next one clear, but um, it, it certainly is different. And, uh, and I think that there are other forms so where he actually did it on the Louis Vuitton building with frit patterns on glass that can give it scale and texture too. But uh, these explorations are happening faster and faster and changing the way buildings look, even if they're all glass. And I think that will just happen more and more and should be encouraged. Um, I have worked in um, and sort of rephrased many of your questions, hopefully, into and, and sort of collated and combined them as we've been going. This one uh, may come from uh, somebody. Sure, uh, may come from somebody planted by related. I don't know, but the question is: you've mentioned the client several times, and you've worked with a remarkable range of clients. What makes for a good and a bad client, in your experience? That definitely comes from related. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I think uh, the uh, one thing I've learned over my life is that it's certainly true uh, 
through, uh, true throughout history is that the relationship between architect and his client is critical. You find it whether it's uh, Imhotep and back in the, with the queen uh, back in uh, ancient Egypt or uh, Michelangelo and uh, the pope. Uh, those things are critical when they, and you could ask many architects about that, Tom uh, Krenz and Frank Gehry on Bill Bow. There is a spark there of understanding that an architect um, is dealing with many, many subjects. It's not just art, it's art and science. And it's also a response to uh, the building process and the financing process, there are many different uh, elements. But often that role can give, uh, is dependent upon one thing, which is usually mutual respect. Tremendous arguments. But at the end of the day, a respect and a willingness to listen and to work out uh, <coughs> conclusions. Some architects, uh, some clients are very involved in every detail, and that's often wonderful. It's not always necessary, though, uh, but an involvement and a caring and a willingness to make certain steps because it's the right thing to do architecturally rather than just the simplest thing to do uh, from a uh, construction point of view. So I would say uh, on, the, on the list of important things to find and to ensure a good design is to find a, a good client. All right, well, thank you very much. That concludes our session.